All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for um, another version of our Parenting with Vision speaker series that we're offering here tonight. Um, the Parenting with Vision series is part of a, a program that we have in partnership with our Moiseta Public Schools PTA and PTO organizations and our community ed department. And we're very, very happy to be able to um, welcome some talented presenters, including the one we have here tonight with us to share information and resources with our parents in our community and to be able to do this for free. So a special thank you to our PTA and PTOs for helping to make this um, speaker series available. Um, just a little housekeeping item before we get started and I introduce Cindy. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so it's available for parents to view who are maybe unable to make it here tonight. And um, if you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat because this is being recorded. We're asking people not to uh, unmute and ask those questions, but feel free to put them in the chat and we will have time to address those as um, if needed throughout the presentation, I can I will connect with Cindy as a facilitator. Otherwise, we'll have some time at the end too. So please feel free to do that. And so with that, I'll give a quick introduction here for Cindy and then let her get started. So Cindy Doth has been with Hazelton Betty Ford Foundation since 2006. She initially began providing direct care for adolescents in the Plymouth facility until a career change in 2018. Her current role is the Youth and School Outreach Manager, where she builds relationships with students, staffs, and families in local schools to provide chemical health screening and supportive services to adults and individuals in need. Cindy helps educate others on chemical health difficulties, treatment services, co-occurring mental health concerns, and related difficulties. She offers staff and student training on substance use and mental health, as well as hosting many presentations for families on signs and symptoms of substance use and how to have a conversation with their youth. Cynthia holds a, Cynthia Cindy holds a bachelor's <laughs> degree in community, or in community psychology and completed two master's degrees in Hazleton Graduate School of Addiction Studies. She's a licensed alcohol and drug counselor as well as a licensed professional clinical counselor. She enjoys camping with her husband and her two kids um, as well as working on a straw bale garden. Oh, I have so many things to explore with you, Cindy, in addition to topic, so. She's very passionate about helping youth and adults, and we are so very excited to have her here tonight to share her expertise um, and to connect with our parents in our Wayzata School District. So thank you so much, Cindy. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, I uh, appreciate the introduction. I am Cindy Doth with Hazelden Betty Ford. Um, and I really, I one of the things that I like most about my job is being able to, uh, help students uh, identify a potential concern related to their substance use, and then also help the families intervene earlier. We know that the earlier that um, anybody is able to identify a concern related to substance use and mental health, um, the earlier they're able to seek out some help, that's, have an intervention of some sort um, at a variety of different levels, and then the better the outcome. Uh, change that trajectory just a little bit so that individuals maybe don't have to end up in residential treatment services. So I do. I love these kinds of um, opportunities to talk and get the word out there and, and really help support uh, parents and youth. So um, I, I did, I think, <laughs> I think it's important to be able to have some data just to kind of put some things into context. Um, and I, I don't want to get too far in the weeds with all of the, the numbers and everything, but I think that um, especially right now with what we hear um, in the news around mental health concerns, around substance use concerns, um, it's helpful just to kind of put some things into context. What I will say with, with this data that I have, a lot of it is pre-COVID. Um, the COVID data and statistics um, are in the process of being uh, tabulated and they're not expected out from a variety of different resources, um, probably for the next year or two. Um, it can take a, a while for the surveys to have that turnaround. So um, this, this information came out of um, the CDC uh, back in 2019. Uh, the CDC had developed back in the 1990s a survey um, called the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System Survey. And what it really does is it monitors 
uh, health behaviors that would contribute to leading causes of death or disability, any kind of social problems among youth. And this is nationwide. So the survey looks at behaviors that would contribute to unintentional injuries, violence, uh, sexual behaviors, uh, unintended pregnancies, STIs, uh, alcohol use, drug use, tobacco use. They look at all of these um, potential high-risk behaviors. Um, and nearly every state in the country has participated in this. Now, Minnesota is not one of them that has participated in this, but, it, but I think this information is still super applicable as we look at kind of the, the country as a whole. So some startling things that I found as I was kind of digging through some of the data was that individuals, adolescents uh, who use, use before the age of 13, they use alcohol, that's 15%. 15% of the population that uh, end up using substances, 15% of them use before the age of 13. 6% is marijuana and 8% is nicotine. Um, and then to me, I, I think those that's really high. I have a 12 year old daughter and I think uh, you can only imagine what uh, some of those struggles might lie ahead for, for our family. Uh, the survey also then looked at uh, individuals who might have ever, those 13 year olds, ever used illicit drugs. 15% um, have, have used a variety of different substances and it, they break it down into some other smaller chunks where it's inhalants, hallucinogens, pain medications, which would include like opiates. Um, we hear a lot about the opiate concerns right now, and then cocaine. Uh, and so this, I, I think, is super startling um, that individuals uh, over the years end up using younger and younger. The survey also looked at what is not just who used um, by the age of 13, but also who, um, who is, what does this current use look like within the last 30 days of, of everybody surveyed who has used within the past 30 days. 29% of adolescents that took the survey had used in those last 30 days. 22 for marijuana, the pain meds, again, that's like the opiates. Um, and then nicotine is 37%. Um, interesting fact around the nicotine use, there's been a, a real push over the years around vaping um, and really trying to help curb that. And the numbers are declining. They stayed steady for a while and then and they are on the decline, but it continues to be a significant risk. Um, nicotine, vaping, cigarettes, uh, and any kind of chewing tobacco really are, are such high risk behaviors. Um, one of the other pieces that I found absolutely startling is of those individuals that end up using substances, 22% obtain them at school. Either they're offered at school, they're sold between students, they're just given away, um, or they're used on that school property. So of, of all of the students that end up using 22%, um, have that direct school involvement. And I think that really speaks to the need to, to have this open dialogue, have this discussion around substance use within the school setting. And I don't just mean like in the seventh grade health class or the 10th grade health class, but really as this continued progressive ongoing conversation. One of the things that I oftentimes tell parents is that it is absolutely key to have conversations around substance use and mental health frequently. It doesn't mean that we're having one 60 minute conversation and hope that our, our young ones kind of get everything that they need, but it's that we're maybe rather having 60 one minute conversations. Um, it, it, our young people then can kind of know where we stand and, and what our thoughts are around substance use and mental health concerns. So I, we look at the, Yes. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Quick question in the chat was, could they remind us what the age group was on the survey data that you were just talking about? Yes. Uh, when I, and I'm going to have to go back to my slides to take a little peek at my notes. Um, this was specifically done within high school. So this was looking at grades nine through 12. Um, the uh, <laughs> less schools ended uh, up pulling doing the data for the middle schools. So that fifth grade to seventh, uh, eighth grade, excuse me. Um, 
that data is you know, the, the, that N, the number that's pulled is significantly less in those lower age groups. So I, I really, I pulled that data from the high school nine through 12. Now, I appreciate that question. That was a really good one. Uh, the other piece, let me just move ahead here. I grabbed some data from the Minnesota Student Survey. So the Minnesota Student Survey started back in 1989. There must have been something going on in the 1990s uh, to have the CDC putting out their survey and the Minnesota Student Survey kind of coming all at that same time. But so within the Minnesota Student Survey, um, it really was designed to monitor risk and identify protective factors among students. And uh, they made some tweaks and changes then back in 2013, where they specifically then surveyed fifth graders, eighth graders, ninth graders, and 11th graders um, to, to identify what do, does substance use look like? What does mental health concerns, high risk, uh, sexual behaviors, they really kind of pull um, physical health even, they, they pull a lot as well. Um, and so here we can look at, this is just within YZ, um, the site that I pull all this data from, you can do it by district, by county, by state, you can kind of um, look at the information in a whole variety of ways. Um, so we look at, at the, and I, again, just so that things are maybe a little bit more even looking at the ninth grade and the 11th grade data. So within the YZ school district, 2% of ninth graders are using alcohol, 4% are using cigarettes, vaping is 17%, and marijuana is 8%. Uh, we see those increase then by the time they get to 11th grade. Now, when one of the, I always ask this question when I go in and I speak with uh, the 10th grade health classes, um, I always ask, what is, when do you think that largest increase of substance use happens for young people? Is it from, seventh to eighth grade, eighth to ninth, ninth to tenth, tenth to eleventh. When do we see that, that largest increase in substance use? Um, and and, and this, the students are really pretty accurate that it, when we see that uh, increase, it's really from eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, it is a drastic increase uh, when we look generally at the state average. I didn't pull those numbers specifically for Wyzetta. Um, but when we then compare the state average to just the YZ school district, those numbers are, are, are below average, and that's exciting. I, I, I truly believe that the district is, is doing well with being able to um, have prevention strategies, have education, and then also have resources available for students and families um, around substance use and mental health. Um, the Minnesota Student Survey also looks at mental health concerns. And you know what, let me back up just, let me pause for just a minute and, and go back and, and make a comment about the vaping use. One of the things that I hear all of the time from students is everybody vapes, everybody smokes, everybody does it everywhere in the high school. Um, and and they, they challenge some of the, this data specifically around the, the, the vaping. And although I truly believe that's their perception is that everybody, everybody is vaping, it's, it's so prevalent. Um, time and time again, when we look at even a variety of different surveys, that this generally 20%-ish is very average uh, across the state, across different states, national averages, um, but it really isn't everybody. And where I think then one of the best ways to look at, at some of this data and these risks is maybe more about the perception. Um, we can take a look at uh, what we call like a so social norms approach, meaning that uh, I might have the belief that everybody is doing it, I don't really support vaping, but I believe that everybody else is. And so because I believe everybody else is, then they must be. Um, best practice would be then to help educate some of those younger students 
the, the reality is most students don't. Most students are very healthy in the district. Um, and if we can help change that narrative just a little bit, um, we can then see decreases in substance use and changes in outcomes. So the reality is not everybody is vaping. There oftentimes is the perception that, that, that that's the case though. Um, so again, like I said, the, the Minnesota Student Survey also looks at mental health concerns. Um, and they look at it in a couple of different ways. They look at it around um, anxiety and depression, as well as breaking it out um, into who is engaging in self-harm and then thoughts of suicide and attempts of suicide. Um, all, again, looking at both ninth grade and 11th grade. Uh, and within the Wyzetta district, um, again, below a lot of those um, state averages, and there is this increase between ninth grade and 11th grade. And by 11th grade, you know, we can oftentimes see that there are other life factors that are coming into play, but, you know, looking at credits, getting ready for graduation, um, academic rigor could be very different. Um, what am I going to do after? I, I graduate, what do things look like? Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm not terribly surprised to see this increase between ninth grade and 11th grade. Life stressors become a little bit different. Um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, I, I had a speaking event with Wyzetta. I had done some other events for a variety of different districts. Because um, there was a lot of conversations around how is it that COVID is impacting mental health? How is COVID impacting our students? Um, and some of the very, very early findings, right? So just trying to get the pulse on a variety of different um, schools. Uh, this information came out of California. Um, and I, I, I believe that it is um, a, a still a real good representation between uh, to, to other schools as well. We know adolescents in the beginning of COVID become very concerned around their finances. It's not just their own personal finances of like, I can't do my job anymore. What does that look like? And when things are shutting down, um, but also like family finances. Um, many, nearly half are concerned around the ability to contract COVID, uh, become very concerned around school. What happens to me academically? Graduation, not graduating. I, I think that there's a, a great piece of grief and loss that goes into this, um, of having this perception of what is it that my graduation is going to look like, and then COVID really kind of made everything pivot. Uh, what does my future look like? And then how is it that my, my these social relationships are now gonna be impacted? Um, we can see that adolescents uh, oftentimes live behind their screen. I've got my, my phone right here, right? Um, they're always texting, they're Snapchatting. Uh, and, and in the midst of COVID, there was this encouragement to like, this is how you did school. You did school virtually. Um, we do presentations like this virtually. Um, and, and although we have, we can express such a concern around screen time at the same time, the ability to connect virtually can be really helpful to help manage some of those social relationships because they're telling us that they're worried about them. How do I maintain these friendships if I can't actually see people? So when we have this, we know that, that in 2019, even before the pandemic, there was um, an increase in substance use. We see an increase in uh, mental health concerns and we layer that on top of this pandemic that we're in right now. And, and absolutely, I think it, uh, it becomes very clear that there are significant concerns for us to be able to talk about, identify, how do, how do we really recognize and respond to mental health and substance use concerns? So that's why then we are here, right? This is the stuff that we get to talk about. Um, and I think it's important to then recognize that, you know, not everybody, um, is going to use, not everybody is at the same risk for, for substance use. Uh, when I'll break this up between substance use and then we can look at mental health as well. But there's five specific risk factors that we take a look at um, that could increase somebody's risk for uh, having a problem with substances. Uh, we know that there can be a family dynamic. 
right? If somebody within that family system has struggled with substances, there very uh, well could be um, an increased risk that that young person could struggle with substances, that there is this kind of genetic factor to it. We also know that an individual who uses at a younger age increases their risk of developing a concern related to substances. So uh, for individuals who, uh, it's another, throw another statistic at you, 90% of individuals who are currently addicted to substances, 90% began before the age of six, before the age of 18. 90% of individuals who are currently using substances began before the age of 18. And so the younger they are, the higher at a, a risk they are to, to have a problem with substances. It helps, it begins to change that brain chemistry and the reward system, setting off um, a cycle of uh, addiction wiring in the brain. We also know that if somebody is, experiences cravings, um, that can be um, an incredible risk factor for developing um, some long-term substance use concerns. That kind of preoccupation, that drive, that, um, that need for, for something different. I need these substances. This is what's going to make me feel better. Um, uh, when in working with students, I oftentimes um, would identify this as being really cranky that when you're not high, then you're really cranky, that you are irritable, you're sad. Um, those cravings can kind of manifest themselves in a variety of different ways. Feeling very anxious is, a, is another symptom. We then um, can also see a, a, an increase in risk with tolerance. And we can look at tolerance in two different ways. Tolerance could look like using the same amount doesn't get you high anymore. So I continue to use, I continue to use, and I'm just not getting that high anymore, or I need to use more in order to get a high. Uh, and when we identify that there is this increase in tolerance, um, that starts to be a diagnostic uh, symptom. The final piece around risk factors, the final thing that, that would uh, be a, a potential indicator of somebody um, being at a higher risk for developing a substance use concern would be their surroundings. The uh, peoples and places and engagement or lack of engagement in, in their environment. Uh, there could be uh, some really helpful surroundings. Uh, there could be maybe no alcohol in the home uh, if they are in an environment where there is active alcohol use, active marijuana use. If uh, there's peer use um, or per permissive use, uh, it can increase their risk of having a substance use disorder. And so we can look at, at these risks related to substance use and we can, can, there's a lot of overlap when we start to look at risk factors related to mental health, right? But we can see that again, that there is this um, genetic factor that if somebody is, struggles with anxiety or struggles with depression, um, that, that within that family system that there could be uh, the uh, adolescents, children um, within that family system could be at a higher risk for a mental health concern. Uh, the brain, right? Our, the, the, the psychological development, how it is that we respond to stressors, how our level of resiliency uh, can, can be an imp, uh, factor in whether or not um, we are at a higher risk for having a mental health concern. Also our surroundings, uh, the, the environment that we find ourselves in, the, the relationships that we develop or don't develop with others, uh, being isolated, uh, not having a, uh, a system of people that we could reach out to. Uh, and we also know that there is a spiritual piece around the development of mental health concerns. And so when I, and then when I say spiritual, I don't mean, do I believe in some kind of God or higher power, but more around uh, my values? Am I able to identify my values? What do my values look like? And then overlaying that on top of, am I acting in a value-driven way? And so when we see that young people are engaging in behaviors that violate their values or they aren't able to identify their values, it increases that risk for developing mental health concerns. So I kind of look at it from this biopsychosocial, spiritual 
uh, world of development. And I think, you know, whether we're looking at substance use or whether we're looking at mental health, it, it becomes very clear, very evident then that this isn't as simple as a nature versus nurture kind of argument. That it's not just one or the other, but, but rather really both. And so again, kind of layering things on top of each other, right? We see that there's this national trend of increase in use. We see um, that there is substance use within the district. We see that COVID has had a significant impact on substance use and mental health. There's, there's this, uh, some people may have higher, more risk factors for both. And then the question becomes, what do we do, right? Well, I, I think in part, it comes to identifying what are those protective factors? Um, what are the things that as, as parents and caregivers, can we help support our young people on? Um, and what are ways to, to maybe be a little bit of a buffer against uh, some of those risk factors that might be present? We, um, we can see that there are a couple of different studies that I've uh, done some research on is around parental and caregiver involvement and monitoring. Meaning that when a young person knows that there is this parent or this caregiver that is um, engaged in their life, whether academics, socially, um, in sports, that that, that provides this, um, a, like, a, like a safety net. Like I know that I'm being monitored. I know what uh, the people, <clears throat> excuse me, in the world are kind of expecting. And that kind of then leads into the next one around the clear expectations and consistency. And I could probably almost break this one up into two. And that clear expectations, um, when those young people know what it is that we will or will not tolerate, and we have um, those consistent expectations, they're more likely to, to follow through um, and, and kind of be in align with what we're expecting uh, of them. Uh, I go, I could <laughs> still use myself as an example on this one. I have an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old. Um, and they're very, very different, uh, very different people. Uh, my, my daughter, who's 12, very clearly can see our expectations. And, sh and you know, we've, my husband and I have been very clear on that part with her. With my son, our focus then really becomes on the consistency piece, uh, that if we drift even just a little bit, then things start to spiral. And so really kind of keeping that, those boundaries in place and doing that on a consistent basis, then we see a change in, in behaviors. Um, another protective factor is looking at positive emotions. Now this isn't about like, I'm gonna ignore how depressed I am, I'm going to avoid it, but this is really highlighting that we have the ability to experience positive emotions. Um, even on the roughest days, uh, just being able to pause for a moment and reflect what was good that happened, right? What were some good feelings that I had throughout the course of my day can help, again, be that buffer around substance use and mental health. We also can see that there is uh, a level of uh, when individuals feel engaged, engaged in work, engaged in school, engaged in sports, community organizations, uh, when they have that kind of sense of purpose, uh, they're more uh, apt to follow through um, with uh, safe behaviors, that they're uh, not as much of a, that risk taker to engage in some of those high risk behaviors that could lead to substance use and or developing mental health concerns. And so this engagement in um, gives them that sense of purpose. Also relationships. Um, and relationships can be tricky, excuse me, sorry, my alarm was going off. Um, when we look at relationships, relationships um, that are healthy, relationships that where there is this mutual level of respect that I can identify that my peers, the people that I'm um, engaging with that I consider close are also looking out for me. Uh, that they have my best interest at heart, and I have this the, my best interest for them as well. Um, so these healthy, positive relationships then become very protective of ar around developing any kind of mental health or uh, substance use concerns. Meaning, uh, this again kind of goes back to uh, the idea of values that kind of identify when we can identify 
uh, values that are important to us, and then we start to align our behaviors with our values, then it kind of puts us um, <laughs> as being not maybe the center of the world, recognizing I'm not the center of the universe, um, and almost even asking kind of that existential question of like, what is this all about? Um, what is it that, that, what is my kind of bigger purpose in the world? Um, it takes us out of uh, kind of that self-criticism of it's all about like how things are so horrible for me, finding a meaning in, in kind of the bigger world and, and uh, meaning in relations with others. The last protective factor that I think is, is also important to, to highlight is the sense of accomplishments and achievements. Um, I was in a, a training yesterday and, and they talked a, a great deal about this as well is that goodness yields goodness, right? When we are rewarded, when we feel good, when we get that A on a paper or that, you know, attaboy kind of uh, experience, that that puts us in a position to want to continue to do more to do more good. So it, again, it kind of adjusts those behaviors and becomes, again, very protective around uh, developing some other high risk concerns. So any opportunity that we can set a little goal and achieve it uh, becomes very rewarding and fulfilling. So which kind of then begs the question, right? How, how do we identify if there is a concern present? Um, if we can recognize that we've got some risk factors, We've got some protective factors. The, the data tells me that there is some potential that, that an individual might struggle with substances. So then what do we do? Um, and, I, and I always, I, I like this slide because I think it identifies a whole variety of different ways to, of things to look at. We can look at people's physical characteristics, right? How they're acting, interacting. We can look at their emotions. Uh, what do their grades look like? Are there attendance? or even tardiness can, can be an indicator that there's something going on. Um, but at, and at the same time, specifically with adolescents, like in part, this is just growing up, right? This is, you know, they're at a time in their life when hormones are raging, right? There's a ton of changes just going on with them biologically um, and they end up on growth spurts uh, or they might be needing to sleep a lot, right? Because they're growing or uh, they, their emotions kind of go all over the place. And so I, I, I always pause in, in those moments when I'm meeting with students to, to really be able to see where are they at just developmentally because they're a person. Where is it that they are at with it showing any kind of signs related to substance use and mental health? Um, and, it, and it can be really challenging. Some things that I then kind of focus in on is, I become concerned when I see that there are um, many of these behavioral and physical identifiers. So if we were to see that somebody is using at inappropriate times, um, this could be before school, uh, this could be at school. Uh, I often times think about how the relationship with substances and school that if a, if a student is bringing a substance to school, it means that there's this level of familiarity with it. Um, the school is a really comfortable place for a lot of students to be. They spend so much of their time there. And if they're bringing substances into that school setting, it shows that they're pretty comfortable with it. Um, and so those inappropriate times of use, I would also include that, right? Specifically that if they're using it at school. Uh, if they're missing work in school, um, it clearly can, can mean that there's something going on. Uh, challenges with money, um, needing to borrow money, not having money, or all of a sudden having money. Um, uh, pawning things and items that if, uh, if they used to have a pair of tennis shoes that they really liked and then now they don't, um, that could be an indicator that there's something going on. We can see the mood changes. Um, mood changes could look like um, being really anxious, uh, being withdrawn, depressed, having some of these drastic highs and low lows. Um, and so I think that that, that one of those, um, that those drastic peaks and valleys um, can be related to cravings, could be related to um, withdrawal. I do see that a, 
a question popped up. What's your experience with lack of sleep with any of these behaviors? Absolutely. Um, I sleep is another piece that I think to, to be able to take a look at. Uh, I was listening to a podcast not all that long ago around an individual who went 11 days without sleep. Uh, he was trying to break some kind of world record. And in these 11 days, he too, uh, very forgetful. His emotions were all over the place. Um, really isolating, very anxious. And after going 11 hours, or excuse me, 11 days without sleep, when he finally did go to sleep, he slept 14 hours. And that was it. And, and, and there is just, it, it blows my mind that after going so long without sleeping that, that he only then slept 14 hours. I mean, 14 hours is a long time, but not enough to be able to make up for all of the sleep that he, that he had missed. And so the changes that end up happening in, in his brain as a result of that lack of sleep very much um, was, was very clear and came through his, his behaviors. Um, I think there is this huge relationship between substance use, mental health, and sleep, right? When somebody is very anxious, it's hard to sleep. Somebody who is, is depressed may sleep all of the time. And then substances can make people sleepy or make them really alert. Uh, and so really kind of teasing some of that out uh, gets to be very challenging. Um, and we can see that around eating as well, right? That if um, some substances can make somebody eat a lot, um, eating a lot could be an indicator of some mental health concerns, right? Um, thinking of binging, purging, restricting, eating disorder-like behaviors. Um, and a way to self-soothe even. A lack of coping skills. So looking at those behavioral symptoms, absolutely. I, I think it's always worth the question, right? And this is, again, going back to what I had said a, a lot earlier is having 61 minute conversations rather than 160 minute conversations with our young people to be able to ask those questions. We can see changes in weight. We can see changes in their physical appearance. Um, the blushing or being really pale, being gray. I've worked with some students where they kind of look gray and ashy. Um, frequent nosebleeds. Um, and then again, kind of how they present very fidgety, right? They're maybe bouncy, always kind of on edge or really lethargic um, could be indicators of both substance use or mental health. Uh, we can also see, a, changes in how they engage in, in with us, right? What do our, what's the changes in our relationship? Um, pulling away from the family, being very secretive, changing their passwords on their phone and not letting, you know, kind of not letting you see um, who they're texting, what they're talking about. Um, and chronic dishonesty. Um, when I was uh, working in the residential world, um, doing services down at our Plymouth facility, um, Oftentimes talking with the clients there about the biggest signs of somebody who's struggling with substance use, sneaking, hiding, and lying. But if I see somebody who's sneaking, hiding, and lying, um, that I then become very concerned around substance use. And with the concern related to substance use also then pulls in the, the concern related to mental health concerns of, are they self-medicating for something? Um, the, the other early indicator around substance use would be a deterioration in appearance. Um, oftentimes, the adolescents, the youth will not shower. They'll, not, they'll stop brushing their teeth. They're not doing their laundry, that they're, they're really, their whole physical appearance becomes um, I, I, smelly, becomes very, not, not just like I'm a developing adolescent, but, but, it, but it's really, it's not kept up like, they, they used to do. Uh, their own personal hygiene becomes uh, not as important. And so we can see all of these signs and we see all of these symptoms. And a lot of them, whether it's subst substance use signs and symptoms can look like mental health signs and symptoms and vice versa. They really absolutely mask and mimic each other. Um, we also know they will make each other worse. That if somebody is drinking alcohol and they are struggling with depression, that the alcohol, it being a depressant, will make their depression worse. 
Uh, and so it, we kind of individuals find themselves in this downward spiral of, of really kind of getting out of control. And we also see that they have the ability to produce each other. Um, that if somebody is smoking marijuana, if they're smoking weed, and it becomes this kind of very repetitive pattern. This is, this is part of their day, their routine. And then they start reporting feeling very anxious, um, that it's hard to think straight. They uh, aren't liking social situations, that they're becoming very withdrawn. Uh, and, that, and that anxiety can become as a result of the marijuana use. When they stop the marijuana use, that anxiety then can go away. Um, so really being able to identify, it becomes so crucial for families to be able to identify substance use and or mental health concerns and have the conversation around both to be able to know how to then intervene on both, right? So now what, right? If we have this concern that, that something's going on, I see some of these, you know, physical behavioral concerns within my young person, what do I do? How do I have that conversation? And this is where we really um, uh, get to kind of fine tune our, our caregiver skills. Um, being able to express empathy, um, recognizing that young people in our world right now are, have a ton on their plate that they're going through a lot, a lot and being able to recognize that, that things are tough. My favorite phrase that I, uh, that I use with students and even on my own family um, is the phrase, I imagine. I imagine that homework right now is really hard. I imagine that you are very stressed out given this partner on your assignment isn't responding to you. I imagine this is really overwhelming. Um, it lets that young person know that uh, I'm, I'm putting myself in your situation. And if I'm not maybe on point, then let me know. Let's have this conversation. Um, I also love to ask open-ended questions. Um, open-ended questions are questions that are would elicit more than a yes or no answer. Um, so something along the lines of uh, what, let's see, what happened today that you're so upset about? Um, being able to, to ask it so that the, uh, the young person's response isn't just a, I'm fine. I'm fine. I mean, we, we hear that all the time, right? Um, and, and then once we get some of that information, to be able to really affirm, really give that young person the validating that I appreciate your willingness to tell me. Ah, now that I know this, now I get to help. Um, and even then practicing some of the reflective listening. Reflective listening isn't a matter of just parroting back what what we hear, but really being able to, to kind of paraphrase it, to be able to um, not the, so you're telling me, <laughs> but in the sense of like, I'm, I'm trying to understand you, is this uh, the, the concern that you're expressing? Summarizing uh, what it is that, the, that we've talked about. And then developing a discrepancy. This is um, one, a, a technique that I think uh, can be difficult to do at times so that it doesn't come out of them accusing you as being dishonest. Um, developing a discrepancy. So for example, I, I did this just working with a student the other day. He was telling me that his pot use isn't a problem, um, that it's just fine. He's not addicted, that everything is all okay. Um, and then in the same breath, he tells me that he was just suspended from school for five days because he was um, using at school. And so I, developing the discrepancy would be, I'm confused. If your use isn't a problem and you're using at school and get suspended, to me, that sounds like it's a problem, but you don't think that it is. Help me understand this difference. Uh, help talk more about what, what that is that offers the ability for that young person to get some clarity. And it shows that young person that I'm interested. I, I really am. I want to be able to understand things from your point of view. I want to be able to understand what it is that you're actually telling me. We know that adolescents in general can be very um, resistant or defiant. Um, and when, we, when they kind of come at us as either defiant or resistance, we don't have to engage in that. Um, 
that if they're resistant and I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to tell you, okay, that's fine. When you are ready to talk about it, I'm more than willing to listen, right? To, that to, rather than kind of picking up that rope and playing tug of war with them, um, we can allow them their space and just kind of roll along with it. And then get to support their self-efficacy, right? Support any kind of desire behavior changes um, or little wins that they're making that uh, where they're engaging in either pro-social or healthy behaviors that we want to, to make sure that we're supporting. Um, again, give them that little bit of a win um, as part of their protective factors. Another piece that we get to do is that this is, um, these four ideas come out of a, a family therapy modality uh, called CRAFT. Uh, CRAFT stands for uh, community reinforcement and family training. And what this kind of um, uh, family therapy really focuses on is communication. And we know that some of the best ways then to communicate with individuals who are struggling with either substance use or mental health is to be able to uh, express things in the positive. So if I have a complaint, uh, I am sick of you smoking pot in the basement. I'm done with your smoking pot in the basement. All right, the, the positive, the, the way that we could express that as a positive is, I really like it when my house doesn't smell like weed. So just being able to flip it and highlight the part that it is that we're really um, wanting to see, right? Um, uh, express the positive, um, express the preferred behavior, express the preferred action that we're looking for. Um, rather than I'm always criticizing. And in those moments, we then get to use I statements, right? And the I statement then is followed by a feeling word. I feel really angry when my house smells like weed because I really like it when it smells fresh. And then we get, and then express understanding is, uh, is just that. I understand you have a lot going on right now. I understand that your belief is that, you know, smoking pot helps you manage your feelings. I want to help you, right? We are offering the solution, sharing some responsibility, depending on situations. Could be, I'm, I'm willing to help you get an assessment, right? Um, showing that, that I'm in this with you. I am engaged in, um, any solutions that you're willing to, to do, I will help you with. Uh, this, again, if we use these four skills, takes that level of defensiveness down and can help really increase their engagement in making some of those pro-social behaviors and really um, strengthening those protective factors. I also encourage parents and caregivers to be able to identify what it is that they may inadvertently be negatively reinforcing, right? Um, that if uh, an example we used yesterday in a training was uh, if you are wanting your young person to uh, move out and get a job, right? Or go to school um, to move on, uh, doing their laundry maybe is unhelpful helping. If I am, making it super easy. I'm just paying all of their bills, paying their phone bills, not charging rent. And I make it super easy for this young person to continue to live at home. I end up then reinforcing a behavior that I'm not really looking for. There's no reason to get a job if it is that I'm always financially paying for everything. And so to be able just to just pause and, and identify what are the things that I'm actually reinforcing that it's, it's that world of kind of unhelpful helping. And so with that, then, there's a ton of services out there. There's a ton of resources for us that if we uh, are having these conversations with our young people about the concerns that we're seeing, because we start identifying some, uh, either, either we have risk factors that are present, or we identify some signs and symptoms, uh, there's ways to be able to intervene. Uh, many times, when I talk with students, many times, um, they, they tell me, number one, they're not addicted. Okay, that's fine. Not everybody that, that uses is addicted. Um, and they tell me that they don't need to go to residential treatment. And so there, there is this world out there that, um, this kind of belief 
that if I use substances, then I have to do residential treatment. And, and that's not the reality of it. There's a, there's a ton of other options and resources, but whether it's struggling with a mental health concern or a substance use concern, the number one thing is to be able to go and get an assessment. That assessment will help identify what is it that is going on? They'll start to kind of tease out, is this a mental health thing or is this a substance use thing and, and where do we need to go? And then be able to, to identify the right level of care. Even with substance use, there's a ton of other options other than residential services. And with mental health, stop mental health services, there's also a, a whole variety of different kinds of therapy options. Individual therapy, couples therapy, family therapy. Um, and, and having that assessment would help identify what are some of those, what are the, some of the best ways to be able to work through the issues that are present right now. There's also non kind of um, formal services, right? We know that there's a ton of apps out there related both to substance use and mental health to be able to work on uh, building uh, protective factors, working on that sense of resiliency um, and being able to track successes. Uh, there's a ton of uh, apps underneath on the sober one um, related to tracking your sober days, uh, which can be a really motivating factor for somebody who is struggling with substance use. Um, the Calm and the Headspace apps, both of those have um, resources within them uh, for in the moment coping skills, right? So if I'm really struggling right now, um, because I have a lot of anxiety because I'm about to walk into a job interview, I can pull up my app and I can, you know, do the breathe to relax. Let me help. Let me work on some coping skills right now to help manage this. And there's a plethora of coping skills. Um, my preference always is in, in working with students and working with clients is what are some of the things that we can do other than use substances or engage in unhealthy mental health behaviors? Um, what are some things that we can do to, again, change this trajectory that we're on so that we can then end up with a different outcome? So journaling, stretching, physical activity, breathing, engaging in that environment um, and, and grounding techniques can be uh, incredibly helpful for a lot of young people. They may say, oh, it doesn't work. I've tried all of that. Uh, and, and my response to that is always, what if we were to do this uh, at a time when we're not in the midst of a crisis? Can we start practicing these so that there is some kind of muscle memory? Could we work on some of our, our deep breathing exercises right away? Uh, and then do it in the moment. And if it doesn't work, we do it again. And we do it again. Um, uh, it takes practice and it takes time to really develop that sense of muscle memory so that that coping skill becomes really helpful for you. So I have talked a lot <laughs> and I wanna make sure that it is that I open it up for any questions, comments, or concerns. I know we've got maybe about seven minutes yet and, and I, I wanna make sure that I'm um, helping answer any other kind of lingering questions that are out there. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. I really appreciate your sharing these insights and resources here with us and for sharing your contact information. Um, I did have a question in the chat come through around um, what's the recommendation on um, alcohol after age 15? Do parents lock it up or does it depend or um, that kind of support at the household level? Yeah. Um, when we, so uh, looking back again at that, Minnesota student survey, one of the questions on there is how, how do you get your substance, right? Uh, and, and it breaks it down with chemicals, and then it also looks at specifically alcohol. And a majority of individuals um, access that alcohol in the home um, or within a friend's home. And so I, I think it comes down to taking a look at as your kind of household, what are some of those risk factors? What is a level of comfort and what concerns do you have? Could it be that it is, uh, that there is a very bare minimum of alcohol in the home? Maybe. Could it be that it is locked? Um, one of the, what I would coach people on is that if somebody is actively struggling with substances, that that may be a, um, a situation where alcohol gets removed from the home um, to, to create an environment that it, where it's harder to then use uh, and, and have access to those substances. 
Great. And I, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now, Cindy. Um, I do want to let the group know that this, just a reminder that this is being recorded and that these uh, great resources that Cindy has listed as part of the presentation will be available for viewing afterwards along with her contact information. Um, we'll send out an evaluation out to people who participated as well as a link to the presentation here in the next day or so. So um, I want to thank you, Cindy, so much for your time and for this great information. And um, any final thoughts here before we wrap up here for the night? You know, um, <laughs> well, the one piece that comes to mind is, is I appreciate everybody's time to be able to join um, and, and learn a little bit more. Um, and if there are other questions that, that do come up related to substance use, mental health, what do I do? Um, the SAMHSA website is a great, space to be able to find info. Hazel and Betty Ford has a ton of uh, resources. And then also connecting with the school. Um, the, the school, uh, the whole district is very engaged in, in supporting the students too. Absolutely, thank you for adding that, Cindy. Yeah. And yes, thanks everybody for joining us here tonight. We appreciate you sharing your time and um, we wish you a good rest of your evening. Take care everybody, thank you.